unless you know, not just cognitively, but lest you know mind and, and will, soul, experience, unless you know the depths of your sin, then you cannot know the glory of Christ's salvation. Unless you know what kind of sinner you are, how deep your sin goes, then you cannot understand the depths of Christ's love for your lost soul or for your saved soul. That's what I think Paul is ultimately trying to get across to the church at Rome. Now, there is one important interpretive question that that everybody reading this text has to answer and has been asked since the beginning of Bible interpretation. And that is, who is this guy Paul is talking about? <clears throat> is it some third party? Is it, is it Paul himself, right, before he was converted? Uh, is it Paul um, after he was converted? Uh, is it Paul early on in his walk with Jesus, but then all of a sudden there's this, there's this something that clicks after his salvation, but now he's better off and this is no longer describes himself? What, who is Paul describing here? This is the question. And there's been lots of interpretation, uh, if it makes any difference to you. Um, uh, it, uh, for the, the patristics uh, generally found this to be a passage that was post-conversion. Uh, uh, sorry, was uh, pre-conversion, like Paul was describing his old self. Augustine came along in 400 B.C., and Augustine's like, no, this is talking about Paul after his conversion and wrestling. Uh, the Reformers tend to carry this same line of thought. Um, uh, <clears throat> those who are uh, not so much in the Reformed tradition, generally speaking, uh, think that it's Paul before his salvation. And I just... Uh, and I just want to point out things in the text that might help you come to conclusion, and then I'll give you my opinion, then we'll press on with the text, okay? So if you think that uh, this text is before Paul got saved on the road to Damascus, then probably the largest reason you would think this is by looking at the text and just reading some of the language. Look at verse 14. He literally states, I am of the flesh or I am carnal, as other interpretations, uh, translations of the Bible have it, uh, I am sold as a slave to sin. Yep. If you roll your eyes down to verse 18, he says, nothing good in me dwells in me, in, nothing good dwells in, my, in me or in my flesh. Uh, and even in verse 24 that we just read, right? Like, oh, wretched man that I am. Like, that's the self-description of this person. And if I were, if I were to come to you and say, hey, I got a buddy, uh, and he, uh, man, he's in the flesh. He's sold as a slave to sin. Man, nothing good dwells in that guy. You probably wouldn't think I was talking about a believer. That's how I would describe it. You'd be like, yeah, that, that dude's lost. He needs some help, right? That's probably how that would work. But there's also... Some other language that would tell you a flip side. So same passage, just start up the top again, right? Verse, verse 22, I delight in the law of God. Verse 23, I serve the law of God with my mind. And then over and over again, the, the will, his, his desire, the will is toward that which is good, uh, which is good and, and, e and, and is and acknowledging that evil is a violation of that will. That's all the, some of the confusing stuff that's back and forth, the tongue twister stuff in the passage. Verse 15, I don't do what I want. There's his will. He has a will. He wants to do this thing, but rather he does what he hates. Right? I have a desire. Verse 18, for I have a desire to do what is right. Verse 19, don't. I don't do good I want to do. The evil I do not want, I keep on doing. This, this, Paul's describing somebody who understands what right is and what evil is, and he wants to do what's right but can't and doesn't want to do the evil but does. Verse 21, I want to do right. Evil's right there behind me. Again, the distinguishing factor. Verse 16, go back up. The law is good and his doings are a violation of what is good. Verse 19, he recognizes evil. Verse 20, it's not I, but sin dwelling in me. 
And then even in verse 25, there's this, there's this victorious answer, right? Who will save me from this wretched man that I am? Oh, praise be, right? Praise be to God in Jesus Christ who saves. So, so, so what do we do with it? How do we understand it? Uh, I, and, and listen, you can be perfectly Christian and think either way or even the third way that it's some sort of period of time after you got saved, but this, you know, either whatever else. You, you can do all three and, and be Christian. That's not the problem. But you got to make an interpretive decision, especially if you're going to preach on a Sunday morning, which is my job. Uh, and so I, I, I've concluded uh, that I believe that he is talking about his life post-conversion. And the reason, uh, the reason I do, it's, it's not... It's not the nail in the coffin decisive thing, but the thing that helps me the most is the fact that the tenses change. He, he's, if you read 1 through uh, 13, it's all past tense. But when you get to verse 14, he's, he's saying, but I am of the flesh. I don't understand the interpreters who think this is just somebody who's not Paul, and Paul's just describing a, just a generic person out there, representative. I don't, I don't understand that. I understand Paul talking, even, even from... From earlier, when he's talking about the law and sin, he's talking about like, hey, the, the law taught me to covet, right? The law exposed his own covetousness. And I think it's helpful for me when I think about Paul. I never, when I describe Paul, I'm like, oh, Paul, uh, he's a great apostle. Paul, he's a great missionary. Paul, he's a great church planner. Oh, Paul, he's a great teacher. I never go, oh, yeah, Paul, he's the guy that covets. But, but apparently he does. Uh, I never think about Paul. Oh, Paul, Paul is the guy who wrestles with his sin. But other places in the scriptures, he tells us that he does. And so I I think this is Paul, right, talking about his life after his conversion. Lost people, generally speaking, do not know they are lost. Lost people do not have a standard of good and evil that is defined by the law of God. But Paul does. Lost people don't talk about their wrongdoings in terms of sin or evil or his actions that are consequential in the relationship to an almighty God. That's not what lost people do. They'll tell you they're not perfect for sure. But a person who doesn't follow Jesus Christ will just say that, I mean, more than likely will probably tell you they're basically good. They do wrong things and bad stuff sometimes, but, but inherently they are a good person. Some, the, the fewer are the lost people who know they're lost Right, who they're sure that they're that they're that they're not connected to any God at all, but they also don't believe in a consequence according to God. Or even more rare, they know they're lost, they believe in their God, and they're just like, Yeah, I'll take whatever consequence he wants to bring, not not fearing hell whatsoever. Meet very few of those people, but some some profess it. But as but as we read and study this passage. I'm going to take the view that this is Paul talking about himself and he's describing his walk with the Lord as an encouragement to the church at Rome that though they are no longer under the law, that they are absolutely free by the grace of Christ, which he has preached regularly in light light of revealing Christ's salvation. He is showing them that they are, are not perfect, So they will continue to wrestle with their sin and struggle with their sin, doing things they don't really, really want to do that reveals their sinful heart and the need for the grace of Christ to be applied over and over and over and over and over and over and over over again until they see Him face to face. And in order to do this, you you just need to do what Paul does, right? What the Word of God does through Paul. And the first is this, right? To know the depths of your sin, so you know the great love of Christ, right? You you need to declare the depths of your sin. You need to come to terms with, come to the reality of how, how sinful you are in, in, in every way. Right? And, and if you don't ever do that, then, then to whatever degree you don't do that, then the love of God is only goes that deep. The, 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 we, we confess already, the law does not bring death. The law is good and right and holy and reveals a loving and just God 
who has a loving and just way to live that our hearts, that our lives and wills and actions can't keep. And the sin that is inherent in us produces death. This is what verse 13 says. Did that which is good, the law, then bring death to me? Absolutely not. It was sin, not the law, that produces death in me. And this is consistent when you're thinking about Scripture. It, it, it runs real true with, with the book of James when he describes how sin works in our life. Just It's on the screen. Just listen as I read it. It says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. Let, uh, if, I, if I can paraphrase, and, and let no one say that the law is tempting me. Let no one say the law is making me sin. Don't say that. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted, right? Is tempted when that person is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. That's how it works. It begins with our own evil desires. And so if you're going to declare the depths of your sin, then you just need to go ahead and declare, and I need to declare, that I'm just sinful really beyond measure. This seems to be sort of the doctrine of total depravity. Right? We preach that here. We believe that here. It's a, hist- it's a biblical truth. It's a historical truth in the context of Christianity. And it, and it goes like this. Total depravity is the biblical teaching that human beings, since the fall of Adam and Eve, have inherited both guilt and sin nature of Adam in such a way that absolutely everything about them is affected by sin. This does not mean that every person is as sinful as they could possibly be. It does mean, though, that every part of a person has been corrupted. The heart, the mind, the will, the affections, the desires, their critical thinking, thinking, absolutely everything. You ever confessed that before to the Lord? Just in your personal prayer time? Have you ever contemplated that? Have you, have, you, have you done something more than a mental assent to that biblical truth? But actually process that to realize, oh, that is who I am? So that even at my very best moments, at my very best moment, there is not enough righteousness to save me. At my very best moment, I am not able to take that very best moment and stick it before the Lord and say, Lord, isn't this sufficient? Can't do it. It's not that every action you do is a sin. That's not true. And we do actions that are pleasing to the Lord. In fact, you honor the Lord when you're obedient to him. Absolutely true. It's just that because of our sinfulness, those actions aren't sufficient for the most ultimate prize, the most ultimate blessing. Because you can do good things and get pats on the back. You can do good things and have a good reputation. But you cannot do good things and enter into eternal life in the presence of Jesus Christ. Everything's tainted by sin. So you have to admit, I'm sinful. I can't really measure that. I can't. I can't get my head around that. Like, it's just, I'm undone by it. We should confess that that sinfulness, that that kind of sinfulness, it actually grieves God. Uh, Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, it says, The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. That's that's the story of Noah before the flood. Paul, to the church of Ephesus, backs it up. Ephesians 4 and 29 through 32, it says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted one another, forgiving one another, 
as God, has for, as, as God in Christ forgave you. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. That's a possible outcome for our actions. That's sort of a, it's not a, it's not a perpetual position because of our total depravity. But it is a state that we need to be aware of so that we will strive more toward the Lord's grace than our works. What do you do with that? What do I do with the depths of my sin? Well, you should start trusting the God that the law reveals. Absolutely. Start trusting that God. And when you read the Old Testament, it's, it's revealing clearly Jehovah God. And the Old Testament's clearly pointing to Jesus Christ. No doubt about it. And then trust the law reveals Jesus himself because he himself is the fulfillment of that law. Secondly, stop thinking or believing that sin has any less consequence than death. We are so accustomed to knowing what our sins are, the sins that we are aware of, and going, well, these things are bad, but they're not bad like this or like that. We're so accustomed to going to having some level of shame or guilt over the things that are wrong about us, but we, but we never go all the way down the slide to go, yep, this white lie, this little deception, this, uh, this posturing so my friends think I'm a something that I'm not, all this stuff, this deserves the cross. And we have a hard time doing that because, because we would just be overwhelmed all the time, wouldn't we? So we need a Savior to stand in our gap. We need a Savior who takes the cross for us. But it's not that we wouldn't ever attempt to think about and come to the reality of that every, every wrong thought you've ever had in your brain that no one else knows about, like, that deserves death. And don't think anything less. All the sins of neglect, all the sins of rebellion. Ask the Lord, right? As David did in the Psalms, ask the Lord to show you your sin, to be reve- for your sin to be revealed to you, for, for to be there a true conviction about the totality of your sin, the, the real weight of your sin. You have to spend time thinking about that. Otherwise, we just get busy doing stuff and we think that we're essentially okay people. And lastly, stop thinking or believing that your sin is not personal between you and God. It is. If you are in Christ, you have a personal relationship with the Savior of the world by His goodness and His grace and His great love for you. And when, and when we sin, it is against Him. And it, and it doesn't just pass away. It doesn't just get forgotten. It, it doesn't just get, oh, that's, God doesn't ever look at our sin passively and be like, oh, well, you know, that's, you know, okay, we'll get through that one. God looks at our sin and goes, I died for that. I died for that thought and that thought, and that thought, and that thought, for that resentment, for that anger, for that greed, for that jealousy. I died for those things. I died for your self-sufficiency. I died for your your desire for a good appearance. I died for that. I died for your covetousness. I died because you desire something other than what I've given you in this moment, and you won't accept this good gift from my hand. I died for that. That's what Jesus tells us. Come to conclusion about that in your heart. And I tell you all this stuff this morning uh, because the Bible says to be mature is to be warned. And so you're duly warned. If you don't see your sin like this, you're getting less of Jesus. But I also tell you that with great hope. Because if you come to conclusion, the Bible tells you to about your sin, then there's a surprising love and joy that's on its way to your heart and soul. It's good. You need both. 
right? So once we've come to a conclusion about this, right, we've declared, God, I'm this kind of sinner, then we, then we live in this description of both death and life simultaneously. Right? This is, Paul gives us in verses 14 through 23 this explanation of truth and experience. The law, in verse 14, is spiritual. It's what He gave us. It didn't come from this earth or from a community. God didn't gather all the nations and pick up the best ones and say, here, here's my law. God said, this is what's good and right according to who I am. Everybody live by it. It's spiritual. And our life then, right, our life's spirituality that we're all seeking or trying to find, it's actually less than spiritual than this comes from. The Lord gave us life. The Lord made us who we are for sure, but our life is tainted, is is sinful by the fall. He calls himself, I'm of the flesh, right? Uh, Flesh is literally uh, just like the the fallen material, the, the stuff of which human nature is composed, right? It's fleshly. He says, I'm sold under sin. He's talking about a, a bond slave. If you go back in your scriptures to, to 6, uh, 615, when he says, hey, are we to sin because we are, uh, says, what then, are we to sin? He says, no, not, uh, are we to sin because we are not under law, but grace is by no means. Don't you know that if you present yourselves as, to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one to whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. And Paul is saying, I'm, I'm sold, under, sold under sin. I'm sold as a slave to sin. Uh, the, the term is used in 1 Kings 21, 25. And, and this is a verse that those who think this is Paul talking about pre-conversion use regularly. But it's a description of, of, that, that Elijah uses of King Ahab, the, the husband of Jezebel, in 1 Kings 1, 21 and 25. But Paul is unlike Ahab because Paul knows the law is of the Lord. He knows God's word and law is spiritual, and Ahab either does not know it or will not confess it, or both. He's different. So when Paul says he's sold under sin, he's not describing himself as Ahab. He's just simply saying, I have this, I have this fleshly part of me that is always with me. So then if if this is true, right, if the law is spiritual and and we've been saved by grace through faith because Christ completed the law and that's now our new character, our new hope, but yet we still have our, our life that is not yet, right, not yet fully saved, the assurance is there, the hope is sure, right, the longing is there, everything's there, it's just it hasn't been completed yet, then, then the reality is understandable. The reality of, of this, 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 this tug of war in our lives, this tension is understandable because our actions leave us confused. This is verses 15 and 16. I, Paul says, I don't understand my own desires. Paul is, has a, uh, he's saying, he's not saying this ever a, a, a mental cognition, but he's saying, he's saying like, this, this is just perplexing to me how I continue to wrestle and struggle in this way. I don't understand my own actions. What I don't want to, you know, what I do not want um, I, uh, sorry, for I do not do what I want, but the very thing I do the very thing that I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree the law, uh, the law that it is with the law that it is good. He, we, he's frustrated by his actions. He's, cl- he's clear on the conclusion of it. He knows he's saved, and he knows the law is good. He knows that he's not. So this is this revelation and reality of the two natures that dwell within us. That's verse 17 through 20, right? This confusing reality exists, but then there's this realization of these two natures. It's not me, Paul says. I know it's no longer I who do it. Well, I mean, is, is Paul having a super, super out-of-body experience? No. He's just saying he knows what Christ has done in his heart, what Christ has done in his life. And the fact that he would continue to sin is just perplexing and irritating. and can't, can't figure out, but, but, he, but he knows it's not what Christ has made him to be. It's not him. He's saying the saved me that will result in the eternally righteous me by God's grace. That's what doesn't desire this. But the sinful me, the part of me that is not completely crucified with Christ, this is what causes me to keep doing it. These are the two things I have in my soul, that which is redeemed and that which is still fighting against the redemption. 
When he says nothing good dwells in me, he's like, that's my flesh. It's not his spirit. It's not his mind. It's not his understanding of the law. It's, it's the sinful desires that in him. He says, I desire to do what's right according to the law because he knows the law. He knows the law is good. He knows the law has been completed by Christ. But that, the, only he can, the only thing he can know that is by the grace of God. It's because he's saved. Then he says, I'm not able to carry out the right things. I can't obey the law perfectly. And because I can, it leads me to sin. It leads me to death. He's like, I want to do good. In fact, I want to, I want to be perfectly good. I want to do God's kind of good. But I do the evil. I, 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 the, the stain of sin is on everything that I do, and I live in that reality. So because of my saved life, because of my salvation, Paul's saying, I know I am saved, and I, and, I know, and I desire to do that which I know is eternally good. And that desire can't do evil. So it is the remaining, not yet perfectly sanctified part of me that is doing evil. This is the conflict. And it is not the final conclusion of my analysis of this passage, but I will tell you that that the more I hang around people and the more I hang around Christians who I understand are really following Christ, this is the testimony of their life. It seems to go hand in hand. What do you do with it? My warning to you this morning is not that we, is not that we identify with this, but that we actually don't identify with it enough. We need to sink deeply into this passage and we need to know the depths of our sin and we need to know the joys of our salvation and the assurance of our salvation. There is a, this is an eternal truth that allows the pendulum to swing all the way, right? A lot of times we talk about things like, well, the pendulum goes here and here and really Christ is right here in the center right here. Well, I, I'm saying, I think this morning, that, that the pendulum swings both ways, and there are just certain times in your life that you swing both ways super hard, and there are certain days that you're sure that you're never going to sin in your whole life, and there are certain days that you're sure you're going to do nothing but sin. And most of your days will be lived right in this measure right here, right in between the two swings. But if you never, if you never get to the depths of your sin or the everlasting joy of your salvation, maybe, maybe you're not... I don't know. Maybe you're just not spending enough time with King Jesus. Maybe you're not asking him to show you the depths of your sin. Maybe you're not asking to, him to show you the glories of his salvation. This is not optimism. This is not control. This is the Lord doing his good work. And I want to challenge us as a church to go all the way into this eternal truth. You are really saved. You are really dwelling in Christ. The, the power of the resurrection is dwelling in you, in the Holy Spirit given to us by Jesus Christ. Man, do you believe that, church? Does that ever do anything for you on a, on, on a Tuesday? It should. It should. It's the most amazing thing you own. It's the most amazing thing that owns you. Because you're a slave to righteousness. You're a slave to Christ's righteousness in you that saves you. And that's the only reason you have a desire to do anything that's good for his glory. That's the distinction, church. Plenty of people doing good. Only the believers are doing it for his glory. Do you believe that you're really sinful? Where everything is actually stained by sin? Do you believe that left unguarded, unguarded by the law, or better yet, unguarded uh, uh, by, the, by the redemption of God's grace? Do you believe that you're actually capable of any sin? Have you ever seen the news or ever heard a story and you're like, I am glad that's not me. And I am glad that, that will, I'll, that'll never be me. Hey, you better hold on. It's pride that comes before the fall. It's the idea that you can do it on your own that will lead you to doing the very thing that you thought you would never do or become. No, no. No, no. You could, you could go down to any kind of sin known to man, left unguarded by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Do you really believe those two things? Because I think they dwell in you. 
And Paul summarizes these, these two truths in verses 21 through 23. I want to do right, but evil is right there. My laziness is right there. My apathy is right there. I want to go do this for Jesus, but my fear of man is just right there. We know it, don't we, church? Genesis 4, 6 and 7. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why have your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. I want to do right, but evil's right there. And he tells, and he tells Cain, the murderer, you got to rule over it, Cain. And, 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 and first Peter just picks up on the, on the exact same idea. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Do you believe that, church? Do you believe that sin is crouching out your door? Do you believe that Satan prowls around looking to seek whom he may devour? If you don't, then you're foolish. You don't have to walk around in fear. You don't have to walk around nervous. But you do have to walk around sober-minded. Paul says, I delight in the law in my inner being, but am waging a war internally, spiritually, with another law within my members, that other law makes me captive to the law of sin in my other members. So, I mean, doesn't, doesn't this smell like the yin and the yang? Doesn't it smell like that, right? We got the white, we got the, the, the white side and the dark side, and it smells like Star Wars. It smells like any other movie you want to use an illustration for that I don't have on my notes right now. But there's just two things inside me, and they're just warring. There's this, great, there's this great story about a missionary who goes and he meets a, some sort of tribal chief and he's like, you know, you're, and he got saved. He's like, well, how do you find? He's like, I find, I find you know, myself like two dogs fighting, one light and one dark. And, and he says, well, how do you deal with that? And he goes, he goes, which one wins? The missionary asks. The missionary goes, well, the one I feed the most. It's a good story. It's not a bad story. And it's not completely untrue either. But let me be very clear about something. Christianity is not an Eastern religion in that sense. We don't deal with the yin and the yang. Watch it, church. We deal with righteousness and unrighteousness. It's still wars. It's still in us. But there's a victorious king living inside you. And you absolutely should feed the righteousness in your life. Read your scriptures. Pray. Sing. Dance to the Lord. Do, do whatever you got to do. I don't care. Serve. Go on mission trip. Do, do, do it. Feed the righteousness. No doubt. But understand that the war is won on the cross. The victory is sure in your soul because Jesus Christ died for you. So what we're doing is not trying to win this war against two opposing factors. We're just trying to, to sink deep into that which has already been granted to you by the grace of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So we'll fight. And then because of that, then you should be loved by the Father. You should rest in the Son's grace. And you should fight with all the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells in you for the goodness that God has already bestowed on your life. Okay, pastor. All right. All right. I'll, I'll be loved. That's good. I'll, I'd love to rest. Tell me, pastor. Tell me I'm going to fight. All right. I'll tell you. You know how I'll tell you? Just look back at the Bible. That's the only thing I know. You're going to fight through confession. Wretched man that I am, who will save me? Who will save me from, from, from this body of death? That is the good question and good confession 
that you should go before the Lord with. Lord, I need to be saved. But, Pastor, I'm already saved. You, you told me, Pastor, once saved, always saved. You're right. But that salvation should be applied every day of your life, Lord. Not, not save me again, but, Lord, show me your salvation. Lord, reveal to me your goodness. Lord, give me your righteousness. You are going to cry out to God in this real anguish over your sin. There's a way to fight. But then you're going to shout with a voice of triumph in Jesus Christ, your Lord. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. And lastly, you're going to accept the reality of your weakness and allow God's perfect strength to give you a daily joy in His grace, knowing that while everything we do falls short of His glory, His grace and His strength is made perfect in that very weakness. And you walk in the light of Christ. Wrestle though we may, victory is ours. And you cannot know that victory until you understand that weakness. You cannot know his love until you understand your sinfulness.